Oh, hello, this is Stefan Kinsella. I, I am speaking today from Houston, Texas, in the, in the United States. Uh, I am happy to uh, be able to present to the Adam Smith Forum, and I appreciate the invitation to speak. I did speak here in 2011, uh, remotely again. Uh, I was unable to attend in person, um, uh, and I hope to remedy that someday and to visit uh, Moscow and uh, Russia. But I appreciate the invitation, and today's topic will be on argumentation ethics, estoppel, and libertarian rights. I have spoken and written on these topics before. Uh, more detail can be found in the notes to the podcast I will do of this lecture after the event. Um, but if you want to follow up, you can go to my website, which is stephankinsella.com, and I will have uh, resources available there. Uh, primarily a previous Mises Academy course called Libertarian Legal Theory, and also a course on the social theory of Hans Hermann Hoppe. So a brief introduction. I am uh, an attorney in Houston, Texas. I've been a longtime libertarian and follower of the Austrian School of Economics, primarily the thought of Ludwig von Mises, Murray Rothbard, and Hans Hermann Hoppe, and also an anarchist uh, libertarian for quite some time. Um, I have developed my own set of views about libertarian rights and related matters, and that's what the topic of today's uh, conversation will be. Normally, when I give such lectures or, uh, or talks, uh, I would have Q&A. This is not live, so I can't do that. But I am completely open to uh, discussion, questions, uh, and you can email me or post this on my website or talk to me on Facebook. I'd be happy to uh, discuss these issues further if today's lecture is not um, sufficiently clear. Um, to a lot of libertarians nowadays, I am more well known for my work in intellectual property, primarily because I am an intellectual property attorney, and so that is one area I have written a lot about because uh, it's a difficult issue to sort out, and that was the topic of my conversation in 2011 at the Adam Smith Forum. Um, uh, and I don't mind talking about IP, but I will say it's not my favorite topic. <laughs> Um, and at this point, I've given 100, 200, 300 lectures on the topic, and there's not much left to say except for me to point to a previous lecture that I've given when questions um, arise. But my personal interest in libertarianism has always, always been primarily in rights and rights theory um, and related areas, economics and the law, epistemology, philosophy, uh, legal theory itself, uh, contract theory. Uh, intellectual property was something I had to solve in my own mind to move forward, but I greatly prefer the topic, which is today's lecture, which is about um, the foundation of rights. Um, my views are somewhat idiosyncratic, like most views of most libertarians. Everyone has their own approach, so I can not I can only plead that this is my own personal view, and you're free to take it or leave it. Um, but I have to present my own perspective on things. Um, because I'm alone in a room, and I don't have the pleasure of seeing you people, uh, the, the, the tone may be more conversational than normal for a lecture, um, so let me just lay out how I see the foundation of rights and the importance of rights, and the nature of rights, what individual property and libertarian rights are, and why it matters. Um, so first I would say that in order to discuss this topic coherently, okay, and I will get in a moment to the different approaches libertarians have to this topic and related thinkers, um, we have to define what, what, our, what our subject is. We have to know what libertarianism is. So I think we need to define libertarianism before we engage in trying to justify a particular approach 
to it. Um, and my current view is not radically different than the way I believed 20 years ago, but the way I formulate these ideas may be a little different because we learn over time uh, what counter arguments to, uh, to predict and to try to uh, rebut. We learn uh, that certain ways of phrasing things are confusing or misleading or lead to uh, error or confusion. So over time, I've developed my current view of what the libertarian philosophy uh, is and is about, which is what I will base my, my, my remarks on. In, in my view, libertarianism is a social theory or a social philosophy or a political philosophy, which is concerned with uh, the legitimacy of the use of force in interpersonal relationships. Man finds himself in a world populated by other beings like himself, other humans, and also in a world of scarcity and finiteness. That is, there's the possibility of conflict and our lives are short and finite. There are some advantages to living in society with other people which is why there is civilization or society in the first place, and we're lucky to live in such an age. Every society develops rules or norms that determine answers to questions about who is the appropriate controller of a given resource. This question only arises because of the possibility of conflict. This is a point that Hans Hermann Hoppe has acknowledged. Uh, Hoppe is my personal, probably greatest influence, uh, uh, up there with uh, Mises and, and Rothbard, who I think are, those three are probably the three greatest uh, intellectual, social, libertarian thinkers of the last uh, 75 years uh, or so. Um, so every society, every political philosophy has a need to answer the question, who is the rightful owner of a given resource? Because there's always the possibility of conflict. So in a sense, as Rothbard points out, all political theories are really about property rights. There's always a legal, institutional, societal answer to the question, who owns a given resource? Who is the proper owner of a given um, resource. The libertarian approach is unique in the way we answer the question, but we're not unique in that we try to answer the question. Every political philosophy has some implicit, explicit answer to the question. So, for example, if you're a complete communist and you believe that the state should own the, uh, the means of production, the answer to the question, who should own this factory, is the state or is the people. If you're a welfare statist, then you think that the poor have some kind of claim on resources. But there's always an answer to the question. The libertarian answer is unique in that it is clear and unabashed and principled and consistent. And to come up with an argument for or against it, you need to at least understand what our vision of social life um, is. And in my view, what is unique and what distinguishes the libertarian perspective from other views is our property allocation scheme. Our idea, in my view, is very simple, and it boils down to a few uh, simple maxims or principles or rules. Um, the most basic of which is the idea from John Locke, the Lockean idea of what we what's sometimes called homesteading or called initial appro or original appropriation. And that is the idea that if there's an unowned resource in the world, like a plot of land, or something else, then the first person who transforms that resource or puts it to productive use 
or who puts a border around it, which Hoppe calls embordering, um, has a better claim to the resource than anyone else, unless, unless a couple of other things happen, which would be the other two principles. That is, unless this original owner, this natural owner, as Hoppe calls it, has transferred the resource to someone else by, by contract, that is, by consent. Okay, so that's the second great, great principle that libertarians adhere to when we determine ownership of resources. And the third would be some kind of restitution or rectification principle. That is, if there's an involuntary interaction between two people, if someone commits a tort, as we call it in the common law, uh, a crime, trespass, they harm someone else by using their resources in a way that was not consented to. In that case, the malefactor, the tortfeasor, the bad guy, um, owes some kind of compensation to the victim. Um, you can call that restitution, you can call it rectification, but in that case, a transfer of property rights could be affected as well. But aside from those three principles, there is no other there is no other uh, rule that we really need to consult to determine the owner of a given resource at a given time. Anytime there's a dispute between two people, it's always, always a dispute about who gets to control a given resource. Whether that resource is the, the body of a given person or some other external resource in the world like a tree or a car or a basket of apples, or a sheep, or a piece of land, or something like that. Disputes are always disputes over resources. Conflict is always conflict over resources. And human rights are always property rights for this reason. And laws are always about property rights. So every time there's a dispute, it's always really about the rightful controller, the legally recognized, recognized controller, that is the owner, of a, a, a specified scarce resource, whether it's a human body or some other resource in the world. And the libertarian answer is that we determine the owner of a, of a contested resource by consulting these three principles. Original appropriation, or Lockean homesteading, consent or contract, contractual title transfer that is, and rectification. And when you consult these three principles, uh, a unique answer will always emerge. Now, this doesn't mean justice is perfect. It doesn't mean that mistakes are impossible. But at least that is our attempt to do justice. That is how we attempt to do justice, by, to do justice, by consulting these three principles. Now, these principles are fairly common sense. Um, uh, and they are embedded in most uh, practical legal institutions throughout society to one degree or the other. The difference is that libertarians make no exception. We are totally consistent. Um, that is, we follow these principles to their end. And we don't, we don't say, for example, that usually the first owner, the first user of a resource is the owner unless someone else has a greater need, for example, which is the welfare status claim. Uh, so we don't make exceptions. Now, that's a, 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 a more or less descriptive account of what libertarians um, uh, believe. So then the question becomes, why do we believe this? Why do we favor this? Is there a justification? What does it mean to have a justification for rights? Um, if you think about factual claims, claims about the world, like there is gravity, or we are humans, or the universe is 14 billion years old. These are factual claims that have some relevance, and there are ways to justify these claims. We adduce evidence, we use reason, we use logic, etc. Humans, humans uh, relate to each other on a, uh, on, a, on, a, on a realm that is not the same as the causal laws. This is what Mises uh, why Mises, uh, the, probably the greatest thinker of the 20th century, or one of the greatest, uh, describes the world in terms of what he calls dualism. 
So he believes there are two different realms of understanding in the world. One is the causal, that is how we understand cause and effect, that is physical laws. And we need to understand this when we act as humans. This is part of Mises' logic of action, which he called praxeology, right? So humans employ means, scarce means, scarce resources in the world to achieve something in the future that would be different than if we didn't act, we didn't interfere with things. So we need, we need property rights in these means so that we can use them unmolested um, or in a conflict-free fashion with other, with other people. Okay, but we also deal with other people, and people are people are motivated by by purposes. Human action is purposive, and that's the fel the field of teleology. Okay, and so when we deal with each other, we seek not only to justify propositional statements about causal laws or facts in the world. But we seek to justify our normative propositions. Now, norms just means a rule. So humans live among each other, and because we have free will and we can choose to either cooperate with each other or to harm each other, humans um, seek rules of social behavior that govern what is permissible and what is not permissible. And the Ultimately, the civilized man believes in certain rules that say that interactions are permissible uh, if they are cooperative and other interactions are not permissible, like crime or torts. The libertarian rule is, as I stated before, it is a normative view, a view of what norms are permissible. So the question is, why do we believe these things? Why do libertarians believe what we believe, and what could possibly justify um, these norms. Now, when I was a young uh, libertarian, let's say 30 years ago, the reason I think I became libertarian, which may be similar to the reason a lot of you are libertarians, is because of an intuitive appeal of the idea of justice. Um, there's something about the libertarian idea that appeals to people that are uh, really interested in the idea of justice. And that is this idea of reciprocity or symmetry. Um, simply stated, the libertarian idea as formulated by, say, Ayn Rand in the 1950s in Atlas Shrugged, um, of course, who was originally Russian, um, or Murray Rothbard in For a New Liberty and other works in the early 60s, late 60s, was the idea that the initiation of force, which we sometimes call aggression, is impermissible, but force in response to initiated force is permissible. So there's a nice symmetry there. That is, um, you're permitted to use force if it's in response to initiated force, but you're not permitted to initiate force. Now this formulation has uh, uh, become a little crusty and gotten uh, criticized over the years because people are realizing, libertarians are realizing, and our critics are realizing that you can't really define what force or what the initiation of force is unless you have a predefined theory of property rights. The reason for this is that uh, you need to be able to identify the owner of a resource before you can determine whether a given action is trespass or theft or not. Um, if I snatch an apple from your hand, it is theft if you own the apple. If you just took the apple from me and it was my apple, then it is not theft for me to use force to recapture uh, my resource. So really, the non-aggression principle, as libertarians tend to call it, is a shorthand or summary description of our property rights uh, uh, foundations. The ultimate foundation of libertarianism is, is the property rights foundation, the propertarian foundation, which I uh, summarized earlier in the three basic, um, basic rules. Okay. 
So the question is, we can justify propositions about causal laws, uh, the laws of physics, the laws of chemistry. We would also have a reason to want to have a basis to justify propositions about norms, what people should and should not do, which social rules are permissible or justifiable um, or not. And most people have the same viewpoint. They do believe there's a need to justify social norms, which is why there's incessant argument about these norms among uh, all human beings. You know, they'll say this policy is justified, people have this right, and often when they say there's a human right to A, B, or C, like education, that's a substitute for their normative presupposition or their normative argument. What they're saying is, I believe there is a human right to this for the following reasons. They don't always specify them. Um, the reason libertarians, I believe, are libertarians is because they have the innate sense of justice that most human beings do, but they also have a stronger desire than most to be consistent. Uh, and they also have a little bit of uh, a little bit uh, extra uh, appreciation of the importance of economics. Okay, just reading Henry Hazlitt's uh, Economics in One Lesson, a basic knowledge of the laws of supply and demand can make you um, uh, appreciate the effects of some policies and realize that they won't achieve your your basic goals in the first place. So I think if you basically give someone a desire for consistency and a little economic literacy, combine that with their basic normal human uh, valuing of uh, decency, cooperation, prosperity, freedom, then they would basically become a libertarian. And the more consistent you are, the more radical of a libertarian you would be. So maybe first you're a minarchist, and then you're an anarchist, um, etc. So let's talk in the, in the closing uh, segment of this lecture about what bases libertarians have used to justify their libertarian um, approach. Um, one would be pragmatic, uh, and variants of this would be called utilitarianism or even consequentialism. Now, as someone influenced by Ayn Rand uh, and Aristotle, I actually don't believe personally that there's a conflict between a principled or as some call it, deontological approach to rights and a practical or pragmatic approach to rights. Um, I do think there are deep problems with utilitarianism, but I think ultimately consequentialism, which is um, a view that uh, appraises norms by the consequences they would have for human life and flourishing, I don't think that's in conflict with a principled uh, approach to rights. Uh, as Ayn Rand said, um, the practical is the moral and vice versa. Things are moral because they're practical. Um, but that doesn't mean that principles are unnecessary or, or useless. Um, ultimately, I my personal view is a principled belief in rights. Uh, the, the utilitarianism is flawed in several ways, and I can, I can only go into it here quickly. Um, is flawed methodologically because, as Mises and other Austrians have showed, uh, value is 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 uh, ordinal, not cardinal. That is, there's no numerical quantity attached to value, and also it is not interpersonally comparable. So, if you if you justify a policy based upon utilitarian reasons, um, the argument is going to be flawed. Um, and there's other problems with that as well, which I discuss, by the way, in detail in my Against Intellectual Property uh, monograph from 2000 or so. Um, now, consequentialism, I think, makes more sense in a practical way. I would say utilitarianism is one subset of that, but consequentialism in general um, is not in conflict with a principled approach to rights. The principled approach says that uh, as Robert Nozick put in Anarchy, State, and Utopia, uh, there are side constraints on action. There are some things that you may not do, um, no matter what, basically. 
and there are good reasons for that. Um, so the question is, what is the right approach and how do we justify it? Well, I think the approach most people have is to consult their own basic values, which I would classify as Grund norms. This is a German term coined by uh, Hans Kelsen, the, uh, the, uh, the, uh, the legal theorist. Grund norms, G-R-U-N-D, N-O-R-M-S. That is certain basic values, like, like favoring peace over violence, if possible, social cooperation, prosperity of the human race, and your neighbors, and your countrymen, and yourself. Um, these basic values inform our analysis. Now, in, when I was a young libertarian, I came to believe and I came to see that there were problems with the traditional arguments for the principled approach, which, as I, as I mentioned, is called the deontological approach. That would be the natural rights approach of Ayn Rand and others. Um, what appealed to me was a sort of a neo-natural rights approach of Hans Hermann Hoppe, a sort of a neo-Kantian approach. Uh, which was adopted and endorsed by Murray Rothbard uh, but shortly before his death uh, after Hoppe introduced these ideas to um, libertarian theory in the, in the mid-1980s. And what attracted me was that it's highly rationalistic, that is, it appeals to reason, it appeals to consistency, and what Hoppe argued which in his theory, which he calls argumentation ethics, which he would say is an extension, an ethical extension of praxeology, which is Mises' uh, logic of human action. Now, Mises himself was a utilitarian of a sort or a consequentialist and probably would not have agreed with the idea that you can extend um, the laws of economics or the laws of human action into the, to the realm of ethics. Um, he was sort of an ethical uh, skeptic in that regard. Nonetheless, he held the same grunt norms that I mentioned earlier, peace, prosperity, uh, cooperation. Um, so Hoppe, Hoppe advanced his theory of argumentation ethics in the mid-1980s, probably starting around 1985 or in 1986, after he moved to the U.S. to study with Murray Rothbard. Now Hoppe had been influenced by his, his, uh, his uh, PhD advisor and another German intellectual, um, Jürgen Habermas and Karl Otto Appel, who were social democrat type European leftist socialists, but who came up with this idea of discourse ethics, which is the idea that any normative proposition that we want to try to justify is always advanced in the course of an actual discussion or discourse among human beings. And therefore, if there's any normative presuppositions of the discourse, then they have to be assumed as true by the discussants. In other words, you could never advance an argument for a norm that contradicts the normative presuppositions of the discourse itself. Now, this Hoppe seized upon and he combined it with his growing knowledge of Misesian praxeology, Rothbardian libertarianism, and he reformulated it and incorporated it into his own um, social theory. His argument in brief is that, is that any normative proposition would have to be advanced by participants in discourse, and these participants are necessarily respecting each other's rights because an argument or a discourse is an attempt to persuade the other person of the validity of your claim, that is your propositional claim, um, without the use of force or coercion. That is, everyone is agreeing during the argument to agree to disagree if they have to. If you're coercing someone to agree with you, it's not a genuine argument. Any genuine argument presupposes basically self-ownership of each party. Each person has to be free of coercion, 
has to own and control their own body. And because, as Hoppe recognizes, argumentation is not just a logical affair, but it's a practical affair carried on by real living, acting beings in the real world, in a world of scarcity, in a world of finiteness, in a world of limited resources. For the very activity to occur, there needs to be some ability of the participants to have controlled their destiny, to control resources in the world, to have homesteaded or acquired resources by contract. So what Hoppe tries to point out is that the normative presuppositions of argument in general um, can never be contracted, uh, sorry, could never be um, uh, uh, disputed consistently by anyone in any kind of argument. And this is, in a sense, what his, his teachers, um, uh, Habermas and Appel, call the a priori of argumentation. As Mises points out, and as a Kantian, there's an a priori uh, realm of knowledge, things that we can't dispute because to dispute them would lead us to contradiction. This is ultimately what Hoppe seeks to prove in the field of norms. Now, this theory, which I discuss in further detail in many writings, um, primarily uh, my argument, um, uh, my article, um, New Rationalist Directions and Libertarian Rights Theory, I think it's from 1996 from the Journal of Libertarian Studies. And also I summarize this in related more recent discussion uh, like by Frank Van Dunn, who, um, who is built on this theory and others, in my article from a couple of years ago, uh, A Concise Guide to Argumentation Ethics. And these are all on my website, uh, stephankinsella.com, uh, if people want to look into this further. Now, when I was in law school, and I'm going to try to wrap up in the next five minutes because this is getting on the 32-minute mark. Um, when I was in law school, I read Hoppe's work, and it impressed me deeply. And at the same time, I was learning about a common law doctrine called estoppel. And I instantly noticed some similarities in the style of argument there with what Hoppe was arguing. And so I came up with my own sort of complementary related theory, which I call estoppel. Um, and estoppel is just an idea in the common law, and there's a related version in the civil law, the Roman law, um, which says that if someone has made a representation, like in a, in, a, in a case, in a court case, or they have made a promise to someone that they've relied upon, or they've taken an action that someone has relied upon that inherently makes some kind of uh, claim, then the person who made the statement is unable to contradict that statement later on. They are so-called uh, estopped or prevented from making that statement. And what appealed to me about that idea was, was the symmetry and the uh, inherent in the libertarian notion, basically in the libertarian idea that force is permissible in response to force, but only in response to force. In other words, we're against aggression on principle, unlike every other political philosophy out there, which in the end uh, ends up uh, condoning aggression in some cases. The libertarian adherence to symmetry and reciprocity um, made me instantly realize that estoppel is another way to understand why the libertarian view is the only one that can be justified. Uh, in an argument similar to the one Hans Hermann Hoppe makes, what I argued was this. What occurred to me was the following, which I've written up in detail in the meantime. That is, an aggressor has endorsed the rule that aggression is legitimate because he's committing aggression. When he trespasses or harms another person, he is basically setting forth the rule you know, the, uh, the or, or as Kant would say, there's a maxim to his action. He's basically saying that aggression is permissible, or that it's permissible to invade the borders of another person's resource without their consent. That is the maxim of the action of an aggressor or a tortfeasor. And therefore, when the victim uh, attempts to use force 
in defense or in response. Uh, and by response, I mean um, not just self-defense, but also a response after the fact to obtain retribution or restitution. So basically, it's, it's an act of force by the victim or the victim's representatives in response to the aggressor and his act of aggression. That the aggressor has no grounds for complaint because he has forsworn the protection of the law. He has admitted he agrees with the rule force is permissible. Invasion of others' borders is permissible. So in effect, he is stopped or prevented from complaining um, about the use of uh, responsive force by the victim. In my view, this is ultimately why the libertarian uh, idea is justified. This is ultimately why symmetry and reciprocity matters. This is ultimately why the initiation of force cannot be justified, but the response to the initiation of force can be justified. They are different, right? So this is ultimately the reason. So that is my estoppel argument, and in my longer article in the JLS in 96 and some other articles, um, I tried to extend this and elaborate on this and, and extend it into the field of property theory in general, not just talking about human rights in our bodies, but also to acquired or homesteaded resources, which we call property rights. Um, that is kind of a nutshell or a summary overview of the theory. Um, in my new rationalist directions and libertarian rights theory article, I go, I go over a third theory, and I also have, um, uh, which I'll link in the notes for this, I have a collection of quotes from thinkers from recent times to times of antiquity, which show glimmers of this basic idea. Um, the idea that, uh, that you, you, you cannot contradict yourself, that if you commit a rights violation, you take yourself out of the protection of the law, um, that if you want to live like an outlaw, then you are outside the protection of the law. If you act like an animal and you're a threat to other people, then they're entitled to treat you like an animal. All of these ideas come down to the idea, this, this, this agreement type idea, this reciprocity idea that I respect your rights and you respect mine. And if and to the extent you do not respect my rights, then you are outside the protection of law. You can't complain if someone uses force to defend themselves against your own violent um, actions, which is common sense and which is at the root of the libertarian idea. So in my view, the argumentation ethics approach of Hans Hermann Hoppe, um, work done by others in the, in the ensuing decades, which again I collect in my Concise Guide to Argumentation Ethics article. Uh, my work on estoppel and others is the most uh, persuasive, intuitive, uh, and common sense justification for libertarian rights. Uh, in the end, we all agree with rights because we all agree to rights. That is, we communicate with each other, we tolerate each other, we respect each other, and when we do so, we, we render ourselves unable to meaningfully say that we don't respect each other's rights. You basically have a choice as a human being in today's world. You can join society and civilization and respect rights, and then you can use the intellect to be more consistent about it and to understand the implications of that. Or you become an outlaw, and if you're an outlaw, then you basically become what Hoppe refers to as a technical problem for others to deal with. Uh, just like uh, human beings have to deal with the prospect of disease and mortality and accidents and nature and weather and dangerous animals, um, so the small minority of uncivilized animal-like people who live among us who refuse to respect or recognize rights is in the end ultimately not a moral problem but a, a technical problem. But luckily for us, we deal with people that are fellow civilized human beings and the most civilized among us 
in my view, become libertarians. I will end my speech here. Uh, I appreciate your time and your interest, and I look forward to uh, discoursing with any of you about any of these matters later. Thank you, and uh, good afternoon.